Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Godsville Christian Fellowship Sunday School Hour. Uh, my name is Dr. Twana Evangelist, Dr. <laughs> Evangelist Twana Jones, and um, I'm here to present the lesson to you this morning. Um, before I begin, I want to shout out to the rooftops. Happy birthday to my brother Warren in New Jersey. Mwah. Love you, bro. I think I took my... There we go. I think I took that off when I did that. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Happy birthday to you. I'm praying the best for you. And know that your sister loves you. All right. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you for being God and being God all alone. We love you. We praise you. We honor you. We lift you up. We say hallelujah to your name, Lord. We ask now, Lord, that you um, forgive us where we've fallen short, Lord, and that your grace carry us through. Make us right before your throne and before your people, Lord. We ask now, Lord, that you clear out the uh, airways and earways and clear up hearts and break up follow ground so that we can receive your word, Lord. We ask now, Lord, that you remove me and that you speak through me that others may know more about you through this lesson. Please let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord, for you are my strength and my redeemer. And all the people said, amen. Amen. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today's Sunday School lesson um, is called Justice and the Marginalized. And it came to me to get a picture, so let me do this real quick. Get a picture. And I thought about it earlier, and now it's coming back to me again. But I did not get this picture, and I think I might have one in this Bible. But this uh, lesson is um, Justice and the Marginalized. <clears throat> and so um, coming from Deuteronomy, the 24th chapter, verses 10 through 21. And I um, did a lot of research on marginalization, did some um, other studies on not just marginalization, um, but what it really <laughs> meant to be marginalized and it's interesting that this lesson coming from um a certain organization uh talking about marginalized people and the marginalized people have to teach the lesson i'm considered marginalized i'm african-american um I'm native american um a woman and so i'm considered marginalized i was put in a certain class um, the people, when I explain marginalized, well, let me just go there now. We didn't even get to the lesson, but let me just go there now. Um, marginalized. So when I looked it up, a person, group, or concept treated as insignificant or peripheral. So insignificant, we know, means, you know, they're not cared about. And peripheral, if you think about the vision, the focus going forward um, if you're focused, you're looking forward, and peripheral is what's out here. So you may or may not see that. You may or may not pay attention to that. But when you're looking at vision straight ahead and you're focusing on something, I can't focus and look at my peripheral. I might see a little something out the side of my eye, but if it's not endangering me, if it's not approaching me, I'm not really going to pay much attention to it. I'll notice it, but I may not pay much attention to it. So I thought that was an interesting definition for marginalized. Um, another definition I found was to put or keep someone in a powerless or unimportant position. So not only <laughs> is this person insignificant or not seen, but according to that definition, you're keeping that person powerless, you're keeping that person insignificant, and you're keeping them marginalized. 
Um, and so there's more on that that will come, but let me get to God's word first, and then that'll all, the context will all come together. Okay. Sorry, I need my papers. I can read this, but then you'll see me making weird faces. I don't even want that. All right. So Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 21 says, um, oh, and another little announcement. I'm sorry. Uh, we are in the Daniel's fast. Um, the Daniel's fast is a fast that is um, replicated after the book, uh, after Daniel, in the book of Daniel. Um, and what it consists of basically for 21 days, Daniel uh, went before the king and he didn't want to eat the king's food when he was first captured in Babylon. And so he asked the king, if for three weeks I can just eat what is culturally acceptable to me, I think this all comes in together, um, which was fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, no dairy, eating unleavened bread, um, drinking water, not having wine, alcohol. And so Daniel did this for 21 days and they found that Daniel was stronger, that Daniel was smarter, that Daniel's skin looked better than all the other ones. He looked his presentation was much better. And so, and not only was this good for him physically, but Daniel was someone who prayed to God. As we know, Dan, after all that, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and the lions didn't even uh, didn't even approach him. Um, God put the lions to sleep and covered him and protected him. And I'm sorry, I know this isn't in your lesson, but Daniel was part of a marginalized community because he was an Israelite. And the Israelites, at that time, were marginalized and they were caught brought into captivity into Babylon. And so they were treated as slaves. So they were marginalized. They were insignificant. They were in not in the main focus. They were peripheral. They were taught they were left powerless because he was serving the king. So the king kept him in a position that he wanted him to be in. And that's why he had to get permission to even eat, select the food that he wanted to eat. So um, in all of that, Daniel's relationship with God also increased and improved. And as we can see, God protected him and continued to protect him and even, give, and even gave him re revelation and vision on the future for God's people. Okay, don't... Whew. All right, let me get into the what this says. Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 21. Um, I need to turn my heater on. It's a little cool in here. Um, and I probably should close the door. That helps keep the heat in. But I'll come circle back around to that in a second if it doesn't, if it doesn't change. All right, Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 21. Woo! Reads as this. When you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into their house to get what is offered to you as a pledge. Stay outside and let the neighbor to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge out to you. If the neighbor is poor, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your possession. Return their cloak by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in it. Then they will thank you and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. Verse 14, do not take advantage of hired worker, of a hired worker who is poor and needy. Whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns, pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and are counting on it. Thank you, Jesus. Otherwise they may cry to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. 16, parents do not put to death. Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Our key 18, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and your and the Lord, your God, redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. Verse 19, when you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheep, 
Do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vine gra- uh, vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Verse 21. Justice and the marginalized. Sorry, I already jumped into some things. Even when I was reading the scripture text, so many things just jumped out. Um, <laughs> so you can see in my book all these little uh, written notes because things were just jumping out of out at me just by reading the, the text. All right. So um, in the introduction, I talked a little bit about marginalization and what that meant. Um, <clears throat> I still can't get over that I'm teaching about how to teach, how to treat marginalized people. And even though um, I am marginalized and marginalized sometimes do treat the marginalized, we're not fair to each other. So this is why God is having to teach the lesson and having me teach the lesson. Okay, so the, the term marginalized came about during the um, social revolution of the 1970s. Um, it was coined marginalized to describe the experience of those who lived on the fringe of mainstream America. Persons were systematically excluded from full participation in the American dream. Wow. 400 years of slavery, and I'm still marginalized, excluded from the American dream. And not just because I don't want to participate systematically, and we see that all around us in our education, in our justice system, we see that in our political system, that there is, um, in our social and economic systems, we see that there is systematic uh, marginalization occurring. Um, So, um, consequently, this exclusion from participating in the American dream um, caused a lack of self-efficiency or efficacy, if you want to use that, um, to improve their life situation. So, reparations, (laughs) as my daughter says, reparations. We are doing some reparation because, um, and I can't, and I'm not going to say that we can't make it, we can make it, we can do it, but we did not start on a level playing field. That's my only point. We did not start on a level playing field, and you need to be aware of that. Um, and I don't know, for some people, being aware of it helps them, and then they know how to, to, to navigate. For others, don't tell me that. Let me just find out. And I, and I don't believe in going in blind to anything. But let let me just find out. And so, <laughs> and you find out, and then you're crushed, and you're feeling unsupported, and you're feeling alone. I know several times, I several times, um, being the only one, the only person of color in the room, the only person of color at my place of employment, the only person of color in a classroom, and feeling alone because there was no one there that had my experience. Now, granted, each African-American person or each person of color, each BIPOC um, um, person is not, does not have the, the same experience, of course, but as a whole and as a group, we do experience racism. We do experience that marginalization. We do experience that systematic exclusion. So um, to know that, I, I don't know, I need to get into this lesson. To know that um, kind of gives me a, 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 a information to be knowledgeable about what I'm going into and what you're going to walk into. If you're out there working, you're in this world, you know, just know those things exist and um, and that you may have to work a little harder. You may have to prove to be more above than anyone else. You 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 may have to bring more what they say, food to the table. Um, 
in your preparedness, in your knowledge, um, in your skill level, um, so that you're not no, any longer in the peripheral, but there's something gleaming or there's something that they see that's being seen that deters the focus and that you're not no, any longer insignificant. And let me tell you, you are a child of God, so you're never insignificant to him. You're never insignificant in his world. If you're doing what God says and following his purpose and his will, he'll let you shine. He, your gifts will make room for you. Your skills and knowledge will make room for you. And your the focus will change. Where, um, And I say that um, focus as mainstream because... Um, the mainstream says insignificant, but not that we want to be so much a part of the world, but that we want to make sure that our part, um, we I want to say is appreciated because we're doing it for God, but we want to make sure that our part is, is um, effective and that we are making a change in the world. And sometimes to do that, we can't be in the peripheral or insignificant, we got to be in the focus. That's all. All right. Man, I have so many notes on marginalization. I'll come back to that because I need to get into what the lesson is talking about. And I just believe that God wouldn't put anything on my heart to, to say or do if it wasn't meant to be said. Um, I, we believe in bathing ourselves in prayer. And that practice I do before I preach or before I teach, before I come into any. Um, any um, learning environment, teaching environment, and whatever God puts on my heart. And it's so heavy on my heart that I have to say it. I have to say what God has me to say. And so the lesson talks about ignorance and wants, and it talks about Charles Dickinson and the Christmas Carol. And we all know about Scrooge and how he was so mean, but then he, the ghost from the Christmas past and present and future came and showed him what life would be like if he continues on his path. Well, let me tell you, that was great for Charles Dickens and that was a great fantasy and a great tale, but sometimes there's not going to be a ghost in your boss's um, a dream that's going to tell him about his, his past, his present, and his future without you there. So you have to pray to God and have God um, give you direction on what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to say, how you're supposed to say it, what skill level you need to get through your day and to get to where you need to go to the purpose, to, to fulfill the purposes he set before you. Um, so that's Charles Dickinson. And Man, I don't know what's going on. But Charles Dickinson, um, you know, this was written for a different demographic. Charles Dickinson wasn't written for us. And so um, we were probably part of those people out there, definitely in the, the time frame that this was written, we were out there. We were part of the destitute. There were less of us successful then than there are now. And now with so many of us being successful, we can come together and bond and put our efforts together and not be like crabs in a basket, pull each other down, but, you know, lifting each other up. I constantly hear that we're on the shoulders of those of our past. Well, if we're on the shoulders, then reach your hand down and bring somebody up. Okay. Bring somebody up. So, and so, the lesson again, talking about marginalization. Marginalized can also refer to race as I described my race as African-American woman and as a Native American. And then also as your gender as a woman or your sexual orientation or sexual identity. If you are um, on the LG, LGBTQ plus community, um, your, um, and you, you know, and you wanna say, well, they shouldn't be any of that if they're in God. Well, you shouldn't be a sinner. You shouldn't be a whoremonger. You shouldn't be an adulterer. You shouldn't be a liar. You shouldn't be a gossip either. So let me tell you, they are welcome into God's kingdom. God doesn't like what they do, and he doesn't like those other things either. They're all sins in his eyes. So let's not, let's not focus on that. Your physical ability, whether you um, have a handicap or disability or 
you feel handicapped or disability, your language, or, and then it talks about your immigration status. And this lesson talks about the foreigner who will consequently is the immigrant in this lesson. So um, I just, I, I just, the way these things are clashing to me is just so eye opening and so many other things. All right, so let me get going. Um, how marginalized, how were these people marginalized? Um, they're used when derogatory language is used. Um, people become marginalized. Um, assuming that someone's accomplishments aren't the best or they are a basic or they don't meet the merit. Um, that's why there was so much um, controversial controversy over, um, oh my goodness, it was on the tip of my tongue, um, over the law that allowed for more, that created us to have more African-Americans, more people of color come into the workplace. And it had to be um, a certain percentage. Um, and not because we didn't lack merit, but we were, um, we did have the credentials and we did have the knowledge and the skills, but we weren't getting hired. We were excluded systematically. Um, expecting certain actions, expecting certain actions based on stereotypes. So you see a group of young men of color walking with that are tatted up and you feel threatened. Or you see um, a group of women wearing fashionable clothing and they're called this and they're called that. Well, no, that is based on a stereotype and that is part of ma marginalization. Somebody is texting me like crazy. Um, that is marginalization. And that's marginalized. When you base anyone's um, ethnicity, their race, their culture on a stereotype, you are using, you are marginalizing them. Last thing is denying, or last of four, I'll put of the major, um, denying someone professional opportunities because of their identity. Racism, and I already said that, excluding someone from a certain job. Boy, uh, that's going to bother me because it's like right at the tip of the tongue. And somebody's out there is saying, it's the this, it's the this. Oh, God. Okay. All right. So the lesson context. The previous lessons in this quarter focused, focused on the aspects of God's law, his covenant with Israel. That was lesson one, um, which served as a foundation for the law. The other lessons also talked about individual tasks and the ruling on God's law in lesson eight. Um, and this lesson turns all the details of God's law for Israel. The laws make up the bulk of Deuteronomy. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the book of law. Um, and it's within the context of the first five books of the Bible, which we call, what the Israelites call the Torah, because that's all that they had at that time. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the last of the Torah, the last five books. So the Hebrew word Torah can mean teaching or law. Um, most of us are familiar with it as law um, because we uh, see the Old Testament as the law and as part of a being part of a um, being being without the dispensation of grace not being part of grace. Um, so we see the see that as the Torah, as the law. But our lesson says the Torah is also teaching. And when you look at the Torah and you look at how the Israelites talked about um, their the book of Deuteronomy and the Torah in general, and even to this day, they believe in teaching their younger generation. They believe in including their younger generation in so that they will know their past and therefore not repeat it in their future. And that is important to know. You need to know your past. So some things you do not repeat in your future. The successful things you want to repeat, the derogatory things, how we ended up in slavery, how we um, lost our privilege, how we are marginalized and out on the peripheral. You want to know those things so that you can prevent them or find ways to go or work around it. Okay, and God will give you all of that if you ask.
all right, if it's necessary for you to have it. He will give it to you, I believe, because he doesn't want us to be marginalized. That's what this text is talking about. So let me just go, and that was some of the history. Um, the um, Verses 10 and 11 are together. Just lending. Woo. When you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into their house to get what is offered to you as a pledge. Stay outside. Let the neighbor to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge out to you. So Moses describes the situation which a neighbor or a fellow Israelite has borrowed something or has, uh, yeah, ha has become indebted to another person. And so they're saying to that neighbor, don't go into their house and get what you think will cover the expense or cover the debt. Let that person have some dignity and come to you with what they owe you. And then you can decide then if it's needed more or less or if you agree. But don't go through their house rummaging through what they have. Okay. Um, so lenders are allowed to receive collateral or a pledge as security for a loan, but they cannot come into the house um, trying to get those things. Okay, and so to maintain the borrower's ignorance, the lender was not permitted to enter into the borrower's house um, so they can bring it on their on out themselves. Verse 12. If the neighbor is poor, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your possession. So loans, again, made to poor individuals. This is why God tells us to be lenders and not borrowers so we're not at the mercy of someone else or some lender or some bank or whatever. He's, he's telling us that we are to be lenders and not borrowers. Um, boy. And so more than likely, if they're asking for a loan is because they don't have the funds or the means to cover a certain expense. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and this is something that I've done. So this is something that I've done. When someone has Acts to borrow money or whatever the case may be. Um, and I usually don't, I usually try to meet the need before they even have to ask um, if I see that need. Um, I just believe that when you lend to someone, don't ask to borrow after I tell you this. <laughs> when you lend money to someone, I don't lend with the expectation to receive it. I'd rather just give it to you as a gift to tell you the truth. But if it's of a significant amount, then I may have to lend it to you and, of course, expect it back. But I will not lend you out of uh, my children's mouth, okay, or out of my household's mouth. I'm going to make sure that my ties, my offering, my mortgage, my car note, my insurance, my this, that is all paid. And then I could lend out of what I have. What, like, you know, all of our needs are taken care of and they're paid. But if I have an overflow and say I have $1,000 at the end of the month left over and you need $200, I'm going to give you that $200. And yes, you say I'll borrow it and give it to you at the end of the week. I'm going to give you that $200 and say, yes, okay, that's great. But I'm really not expecting that back. Or I may just give it to you as a gift and say, don't worry about it. And, you know, if you decide to give it back, that's up to you. But I'll say don't worry about it and give it as a gift. Because if a person's borrowing money, they're already in a deficit. And borrowing really puts you in a further deficit. And so to get out of that deficit, somehow you have to accumulate more than what you had. And so, um, and it could be, sometimes it could be, um, a financial trial, like somebody's sick in the hospital needs money to get out of the hospital or for jail, needs money for bail, whatever it is, or for um, maybe their paycheck didn't come or maybe they got laid off from their job. So there's a, a, a void there that needs to be filled. So trying to do the catch up puts more strain and stress on that person. So for me, it's easier to say, here, have this, and it's a gift to you. And if they say, yes, I'll, I'll pay it back and say, okay, whenever you can pay it back. But I'd rather give it as a gift so it's not a strain to that person. Um, and you can say, well, you're not eating the fish. Well, I'm not giving them this gift every month. I'm giving this gift to fill the void 
and the need, and then they are to go out and keep on fishing, okay? So, and I and I teach my children to do the same, that you, you know, you, you know, don't give out of your rent money or your mortgage money, give out of your surplus out of what, and you know, unless God says different, but God's not going to let you go, um, he's not going to put you in a homeless state to get somebody else out of a homeless state. Um, I see that nowhere in scripture. Okay. He hears the cries of his children. Um, he, I see health as the children's bread. He gives us covering. He gives us what we need. And he will tell you when and where to give. And he will expect you to give out of your own heart. All right. Um, and when I saw that too, something that came to mind to me was Interest rates have skyrocketed. I remember my first credit card was a Visa MasterCard. I used to work Visa MasterCard when I first moved here. And the interest rate was only like 10%. 10% and you don't pay that 10%. You only pay that 10% if you don't pay your balance in full. And that's the same with credit, any credit card these days. But now I've been looking at like some of the stuff that comes in the mail and you're offered 0% for one year. Don't fall for the trap. 0% for a full year, and you can pay off that balance. But if you don't pay it off, the interest can be 25 to 33%. That's usury. I remember when that was considered usury to charge someone three times the, the regular interest rate. So just be careful out there. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to do your finances. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what God tells me to tell you. Try not to get in debt. And when you're, you know, um, well, if you're in debt, find a way to pay back your what you owe. Try to wait, find a way to pay back what you owe. If it's taking a second job, if it's getting quote, a side hustle, then do that and pay what you owe. You feel much freer about life and, and about loving your brother and sister. And you don't feel like you have to hide from someone because, oh man, I owe them a hundred bucks and they're going to ask for their money. And I don't want, you know, it, it eases the stress and eases the, the 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 tension between people. Even if you loan someone a hundred, two hundred dollars, whatever, a thousand, whatever it is, it eases the stress if you just give it as a gift. And and in your heart, not expect it back. But maybe you're saying to them, okay, I want you to pay it back because you have to give some expectation. And maybe you're teaching someone how to pay back or cover their loans, and that's fine. But do not loan it if it's going to put you in a crutch and you can't get out. So then you'll be in debt <laughs> and you'll be in a void. So um, just give from your heart and give as God says. I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right. 30, return their cloak by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in it. Then they will thank you and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord, your God. So the scripture is saying that um, if it's a cloak, a person's coat that they're using as a pledge against a loan, um, their house as a, a pledge against a loan, their car, that you know they need to get to and from work every day. Don't take it overnight or don't um, give it to them at sunset so that they can have something to cover themselves to sleep with. And they will thank God for you for being kind to them. See, and God will be a blessing. It'll be a blessing. You'll get prayers on you instead of someone trying to cruise. Okay? So the lenders result in two outcomes. One, the lender, uh, the borrower would thank the lender, of course. And two, they and offer prayers of thanksgiving to God for their for for the lender's kindness. And then secondly, I'm sorry, um, one, the borrower will thank the lender and they will offer prayer and offer prayers of kindness to the Lord for that lender. And then secondly, because one had an A and B, secondly, the lender's gestures would be judged by the Lord and deemed as righteous. Now that's where it really counts. Um, you know, you're like, you may have four coats or whatever, and you're keeping this person's coat. That's not right. That's like David taking the sheep from the one shepherd. Um, when he had a whole harem 
Um, so that's not right. So that what God is saying is when you do that, he judges it and deems it as a righteous act. And that's where we want our stars. That's where we want the, the jewels in our crown to be in what God says. So that's just food for thought. Um, his own nature is one of the righteous and his justice. God desires his people to live in this manner because that's how he is. He's righteous and he's just. Lending practices as prescribed by the law served as an example of the just and equitable actions the Lord wants his people to pursue, especially toward those who are marginalized. All right. So part two of this, just labor. Opposition forbidden. 14a says this. Do not take advantage of a hard worker who is poor and needy. Wow. When I read that, I all, all kinds of things happened to me. I kept thinking of all the people, all the immigrant workers that are paid below minimum wage because they have nothing and people are getting away with that. Or like in Hollywood in California, you heard of so many people who have taken um, immigrant workers and made them housemaids. And maybe they were being somewhat um, giving them a home or somewhat, but they really weren't being fair to them. They were taking advantage of them because they knew that they did not have a home. They knew they can pay them at a lower wage. They knew that they can demand more from them and give them less. And so that is taking advantage of a hired worker that is poor and is needy. Um, uh, what does the scripture in Matthew 25, 40 and 45 say? Um, that's Matthew 25 verses 40 and 45. The, um, the king will reply, whatever you did for one of my, for one of the least of my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then 45 is the opposite. Whatever you did not do for one of my least brothers or sisters, you did not do for me. And it's like, get away from me, you children of iniquity. Woo! We don't want God to, to cast us out. <clears throat> so we want to consider that whatever we do for our brother or our sister, especially those who are poor, who are needy, who are marginalized. Um, I hate that word. Who are poor and needy. Um, or who are, in a, I like to say, in a void or without, for whatever reason, whether it be because of their race, gender, their age, because of their physical ability, learning disability, whatever it is, God says, whatever you do to the least of these, you've done unto him. So think about that. When you, when you have the means to lend and you're wondering, man, should I do this? Should I not? God is saying you're doing that to the least of these. And the and it comes to mind. Um, I won't go into that. It comes to mind like sometimes we have. Oh, I will. We have uh, certain relatives that just keep coming to us. And I was speaking with a friend about this just the other day. Um, certain relatives that we want the best for them, but they choose to or feel that they can't get a leg up. And and we can see that some of their activities are the reason why it's some of the people you're hanging with is some of the ways you're spending your money, but we don't want to be uh, critical to them. And when we talk to them, they feel like we're being critical, but we can see the whole picture and they can't see it. So just continue to pray for them, give where you can in advice and monetarily where you can um, let God lead you on that. Um, don't let them victimize. Don't let them become victimized or, or um, have you be the borrower and victimize them, um, let them take the victimized role. Um, just keep praying that God will lead you in that. Um, sometimes that's their hustle. Uh, and I'm being straightforward, y'all in this color, y'all know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's just their hustle. Let me borrow, uh, let me borrow like 10 dimes today. You know, 10 dimes you say, well, that's nothing. And then tomorrow it's like, well, give me a 20. And then next week it's like, you know, I. Uh, you know, my uh, room, this is actually, that my roommate has COVID, so I need to stay in a hotel. Well, you know, when my family had COVID, I caught COVID first that I know of. I caught COVID first. We were already in the house. You're already there. You're going to have to stay there, self-medicate, go to the emergency room if it's something more detrimental, and stick it out. 
I didn't get the luxury to go to a hotel or send my family to a hotel room because I had COVID. I had to stay in my room, put my mask on, and barricade myself in my room. But my family kept coming in <laughs> in the room to be with me, even though they wore their mask and sat at like the end of the bed or the end of the room. And of course, my husband, we shared the same bed and saliva and all that. So he had it had it automatically and he had been in communication with the kids as well so we don't know exactly how it spread but i did have it and of course i consider that the reason why it spread but i didn't get the luxury of sending my family to a hotel because i had covid um we had to stick it out so some things it's like no i'm not giving you money for that because you can work through that so to me that's like then this is my own judgment. This is what God placed on my heart. To me, that was just a hustle to get money. So anyway, um, boy, Lord got me saying a lot today. All right. So anyway, so don't take advantage of hired workers and don't let anybody take advantage of you. Um, show them the more excellent way to turn the other cheek. Show them the more excellent way. Um, um, Something I had written here with low wages for immigrant workers. Um, we don't want to see, uh, and then those low wage workers, then when they come in and they get jobs and they get skills, then you get mad because, quote, they're taking our jobs. They're not taking our jobs because you didn't do the work to get that job. So they're not take, taking a job from you. They're taking a job that they earned. They're taking a job that they worked for, and that should be due to them. I'll get off of that. 14b, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of our in one of your towns. So whether they are um, a foreigner coming in, which would be an immigrant, um, considered an immigrant person, or whether they are a fellow Israelite, your brother or sister in Christ, or your or your neighbor. Um, that you may know. Um, do not take advantage of them and their work that they do. Um, I know that there are kids that come to the neighborhood, can I break your lawn? And there are still kids that do that, praise God. My son was out doing that the other day, shoveling snow. And so don't take advantage of those children and put them and say, well, I had it hard, you're going to have it hard too. Well, you know, be fair to them. And be grateful that even that kids are even coming to to work because there's so many youth that don't even you know feel entitled. And so be fair to them, and if they do a good job, give them a tip, you know. And and don't let it be your words down the street and running traffic. Give them a tip. Show them that you appreciate them. Encourage them to go on because it, for you it's like you know twenty dollars your lunch money or whatever. But for them. It means a whole lot. It's the beginning of their business, beginning of their entrepreneurship. So encourage them. Okay, I'm back. I missed the whole page here. Okay, uh, 15A. Pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and are counting on it. So uh, workers were paid for laborers at the end of an agreed time period. And today, we have, when we apply for a job, we sign a contract, we say, and for a teacher, it used to be once a month, and now a lot of teaching jobs are paying twice a month, which is amazing, because you could work for a whole month, and then, have, and that's what goes on the books, then you have to work for another whole month to get paid for the month before, and that's two months of working, two months of going back and forth to work, two months of gas, two months of busing, two months of driving the riding the light rail two months of lunches two months of groceries two months of mortgage or rents two months of everything not being cared for because you're working so <clears throat> that's why and they put teachers in a bad space and so i noticed in my teaching profession they'll ask uh if you'd like an advance at the mid of the month when you're a new teacher so those who are teaching this is so for you um, or maybe your current worker. So they would give an advance. But now I've noticed that a lot of teaching professions, they're paying every other week or every two weeks or the 15th and 30th or something like that. So that that 
it encourages the worker to continue working. It's hard to work for a whole month and go through all these trials, tribulations, and all this and that that's going on and not see your reward. So this is all the scripture is saying. Whatever that agreed time is, give them their pay. Give them what's due to them. Because um, you've made a contract. you made agreement. Be a man or woman of your word. Um, 15B. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. So you will be guilty of sin because you didn't... Um, be that man or woman of your word and you didn't agree, you didn't uh, fulfill the contract. Um, and and I don't want to give any um, loopholes because I do know sometimes some things happen um, with the bank. But if you're a person in business and you're relying on a check from this person to pay that person, that's not good business. If you're going to pay this, if you agree to pay this person a certain amount, pay it out of your profits and your proceeds not out of what somebody else owes you. It shouldn't be dependent on someone else owing you something to pay that person. Um, that's not fair to the person you have the contract with. Your contract is with them, not with them and them. You know? So be a person of your word. All right. So let's go to <clears throat> Just Community Part 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> what did I want to say? Oh. Let me say, centuries later, the prophet Malachi warned Israel that God would come to put you on trial against those who defrauded laborers and their of their wages. So God warned them that if you deal with people um, sleight of hand or deceitfully, you have been warned. God will put you on trial and you do not want to be on God's trial. Let me tell you, we need all the mercy, grace, and covering of the blood that we can get from God just to get through the day. <clears throat> you do not want to be on God's trial. So God said he would deal decisively and swiftly with those who did not show justice to their workers. So keep that in mind. That word was good then and it's good today. <clears throat> now we'll go on to part three, just community. <clears throat> Excuse me. Parents are not to be put. Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sins. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so, and so, what God is saying <clears throat> that. Um, there was a deacon that used to say this at the Lamaris. Every tub sits on its own bottom. So every tub sits on its own bottom. So every person sits on their own sin. Every person sits on their own success, their own reward. Every person does. And so the parent should not be punished because of the child, what the child does. And um, and I'm not saying a, a a child, an infant child. I'm saying after they become an adult, that you've raised them, you've given them what God has asked you to give them. If you raise them in the way they that they should go, you pray over them, you pray for them. Then the parent should not be punished for what that grown child is doing, because now they're a, a person of their own uh, of their own voice, their own um, decision making, and and. Although sometimes you regret to hear what your grown children are doing or or may or have done and it may hurt your heart, but the parents should not be punished for that because now they are an, an adult and you've done your job, so to speak, um, even though parenting never ends, you're always uh, parenting your children. But for the most part, you've done your child their job until their maturity and they have to make their own decisions. There's come, there comes a time when you have to loosen the apron strings, let your children make their own decisions, let them grow up and be adults. They're not going to know how to be adults any other way than to actually do it and to put it into practice. So that's what this scripture is saying. And so, um, however, this principle does not contradict what is found elsewhere regarding God's punishing the children for their sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So those parents who hate God and have not taught their children 
the ways of the Lord and the ways of God, um, they will feel that punishment to the third and fourth generation. And in the same way as the person who um, raises their child in the way that they should go, who continues and blesses their children with what God has to say, they will be blessed to the third and fourth generation. You may not see it in that next generation. It may skip a generation, just like some um, features and some heredity um, aspects, they skip a generation. But God is saying that there are blessings if you raise your children in the way that they should go. There are blessings if you um, teach them all that you know to do in the word of God. All we can do is our best. I remember someone telling me that when I got when I first had my daughter at work. He said, all you can do is be the best mother you can be. And that has always been my prayer to be the best parent that I can be to each of my children individually. I used to pray it to be the best parent blanket, but to be the best parent to each child um, individually. And then I and then consequently as a teacher. I would pray the same, help me to be the best teacher that I can be to each of my students individually. And I'd have over a hundred students and that's a lot of prayer. <laughs> so anyway, and, and, and I just feel that God has filled that. I feel that he's answered that prayer in so many ways. And, and although sometimes they go off the deep end, sometimes they go out of the realm of what I personally taught them, I know that God will bring them back and I know that God will bring them to their senses because God is in them. He, he has to do it. That's the promise of his word. He has to um, con convict us when we are in sin, when we are his and we are in sin. The Holy Spirit convicts us. All right. Um, that condemn us, convicts us. Okay. While each um, person will surely experience the consequences of their sin, that's the person themselves, the repercussions of those sins are often experienced by others. So that ripple effect, even though um, you've sinned and you say, well, it's just me, I'm grown, I do what I want to do. And you go out there and do what you want to do. You don't realize that it affects not only you, but the person you sinned against. And then the person that um, saw the sin possibly. And then the person that you're connected with that, says, oh, well, this happened and I didn't think you would do this to me or do this to that person. If you did that to them, you do that to me. You know, it, it, it's a ripple effect and it and it goes outward. And so we have to be very um, cognitive of that and be aware of that. And not that we can walk around and not commit any sin. We're going to commit sin. That's what forgiveness is for. That's what the plan to come to your brother or sister and repair any breach is for um, because we are going to sin, but be cognitive when you do sin and you're being big, bad, and bold, and it happens. Know that there is a ripple effect, and and don't wonder why, you know, this person's not talking to you or this person's treating you ill or whatever. Um, really, and really shouldn't be. Um, if they are in Christ, there should be some repair. However. Um, when it happens, there's that consequence because sin occurred. That, that's what the Bible says. And and the only way to repair that is through forgiveness. The only way to pre pre repair that is through repentance and forgiveness of sin. Okay, restoration. God has a way to restorize, rest, restore, restore. Okay, caring for the needy. Oh my, talking too much. Do not deprive the foreigner of the or fatherless of justice or take the cloak of a widow as a pledge. Now here we see three different groups. We see the foreigner, which I consider, um, I compare to the immigrant, someone who's come in that doesn't speak your language, doesn't have your culture, your ways, that's considered the foreigner. The fatherless, someone who has lost um, their, their parent. Or I even would say in this day and age, someone who's never known their father. Um, they're still fatherless because they weren't raised with that male figure and that um, that father in their home. And then the widow. And these are all uh, areas or, or communities that are marginalized. Um, the foreigner, because they don't speak their language, well, I can't communicate with them, so I don't see them. I don't, if I don't see them, I don't talk to them. That's not what God's saying. Or the fatherless. So if, they're just wayward. They, daddy wasn't in the home. They're, they didn't handle. They just act any kind of way. 
he said, do not deprive them of justice. They still need mercy and grace. Or the widow who once was with her husband and they were out and about. And I see this um, in my organization all the time um, that the, the woman, she now becomes a widow and her prominence, if you will, in the church changes because now she's not the first lady and now she's not the pastor's wife um, because she's a widow. And it should, and though the respect for the individual hasn't changed, um, but the significance has changed. That person suddenly becomes moved to the peripheral. Um, we know that they're there, but they're not the person we want to go to. And really that's the person we should go to because they're wise. Um, but they're, they're, they've been moved to a, per, a, per, a peripheral view. And so, um, so don't take advantage of those groups. That's what the, the, the lesson is telling us. Um, the law provided for numerous reminders to God's people to uphold justice for those who needed it most. Concerns for these three groups extended into the New Testament as well. See, God has not forgotten and he doesn't want us to forget either. God desires justice for needy individuals and his people are to desire the same. So we're to desire, he desires justice. God's commands justice for living requires extra attention to vulnerable people. We need to help and make them feel special. Um, I'll leave it at that. Even the fatherless. So those that are in foster care, those who are off orphaned, um, those who did not grow up with the father in their home, they're vulnerable. And God is saying we should give special attention to them, give them extra attention because they need it. And I know it's like some kids that didn't have their fathers and they, they're doing things out for that attention because they, they didn't get it from daddy. So they're crying out in other ways. Maybe it's the way they dress, the way they act. Maybe they're, you know, just being loud in their personality because they're crying out for the attention. And God is saying, we can help rectify that by giving them the extra attention they need. All right, corporate memory, verse 18. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. So Moses reminded the second generation of, of Israelites of their history as slaves in the land of Egypt. Um, uh, that along with God's redemptive act served as a founda foundation for Israelites' identity. Corporate memory of that bondage helped them to be kind to others in a, in a sense. It was a motivation for the Israelites to be compassionate. Um, it also reminded them of their suffering and when they were marginalized. Um, so you can think of a time when somebody put you in a bad position and you were marginalized, thought of as insignificant, put in the peripheral, not seen. Think of how you felt. Um, you know, not that the act, not that just the act happened, but think about how you felt. There's a saying that people don't care what you do; they care about how you make them feel. And if you and if you were made to feel lower than you know dirt or feel um, um, at, you know, out of the realm of the of the mainstream or feel, um, there's that word marginalized. You'll never forget that. You'll never forget that. Um, and you can probably recount the experience and who and what what and what happened till this day. But take that feeling that you had and Put it in the situation that you're in when somebody's coming to you or when you see a need. Put it into the situation when you see a need and how did you feel? And not to say that you can say how they're feeling, but how did you feel? And that will give you compassion to extend mercy to that person, to that vulnerable person and to that person who is out of, uh, who is in need. All right. So then they talk about the power of memory. 
um, this little story about a man asking his neighbor for a, um, what is it, a battery charger, and and the guy was like, oh, just take it back and get it, give it back whenever you need. And you know, and that's pretty much what we should, how we should lend. And then so the guy brought it back after he used it, and he said, well why did you just let me use this and not give me a date and say, bring it back tomorrow or whatever? Um, and he said, because somebody lent it to him when he first had his family and he was trying to get to him from work and he needed a battery charger. So he remembered. And that's what we are to do to remember. So how do memories of God's work in your life shape your behavior? So how do memories of God's work in your life shape your behavior? Think about how God blessed you. Think about how God was the bridge over troubled water. Think about how he was a way maker when there was no way and how he did that for you. And sometimes he does that. A lot of times he does that through people who don't even know your situation or things that he'll send to you he, that, you know, you weren't even aware of. Think about how God's uh, work in your life shape your behavior. Does it make you a bitter person? It shouldn't. It should make you a better person. And that better person is one that feeds the community, if you're able, that lends to their neighbor and not begrudgingly, um, that learns to be a giver. Um, my mother was definitely a giver, and I, and I definitely know I'm following in her tracks and that. She was a giver. She just gave, 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 and gave so much that it hurt my heart. <laughs> It's like you're taking advantage of you, mom. And and so and then, you know, you, some people say, well, common sense come in. Don't let common sense come in. Let the spirit of God come in and direct you because your blessing is with him. Don't worry about what the people say, what they do, because I know I was one of those people. I used to say, mom, don't do this. Or, mom, they're just saying, you know, she would just tell me to be quiet, put me in my place and stuff. But she knew that what God was telling her to do needed to be done. And she did that. And I'll tell you, God just blessed her throughout her life. Um, she remained single. She didn't remarry after her, after her, my dad divorced and God just took care of her through her life. I mean, you know, just bless her, not just passing by blessings. I mean, she was just blessed through her life, like, you know, to keep her house, to live in her house, to, you know, to rent out to people. God just blessed her to have a car, to have community around her. God just blessed her, even in her latter years. Um, even, you know, she came to live with us, but God just blessed her, you know, immensely. And then she was a blessing to us, even in her departing. She was one who showed us how to die, how, you know, how to die and leave inheritance to your children. Um, thank you, Mom. God bless you. Okay, um, get all choked up. All right, let's finish up verse 19, just harvest, just harvest. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheep, do not go back and get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. So here again, these three groups, that would be the, um, the immigrant, the orphan, um, the, the, the child that's in uh, foster care, they're not with their parents, um, the widow, you know, the, the woman has, who has lost her husband. So leave it for them. The working of harvesting, the work of harvesting was completed with a hand sickle, cutting bundles of grain and binding each into a sheath. And a sheath was just a bundle of uh, wheat together that was bundled together. It could be anything bundled together. And, I, and I'm telling you, and it came to me immediately when I read that, about the story of Ruth and uh, Naomi when they came back to um, to Bethlehem. Let me see where they come back from. When they came back to their hometown, their Jerusalem, they came back and they needed food. And uh, Ruth went out 
to glean. And so what they would do is glean. So whatever was left behind, the gleaners would come and pick up the scraps. And I remember when we would go to Miller's Farm um, at the, our old church, Pilgrim Rest, we'd go to Miller's Farm and we were considered the gleaners. They would harvest the farm and take everything they were going to take. And then they would open the farm to gleaners. And, you know, you pay $5, $20, $5 a person or, or $10, whatever it was. Five dollars per family, whatever. It was very cheap. And we would go and get like the potatoes that weren't pulled up. We would get the corn that was left up the stock. We would get the onions. And a lot of it was still really good food. We get the cucumbers. I just remember going there and getting so much. And then they also had hay rides and mazes and all this other fun stuff. But you would go and get so much and it would be an all day thing, let me tell you. And we would pick and harvest and get those things and we'd wash those vegetables bring them to the church tomatoes whatever it was and we would bring them to the church on a big table and people would get what they needed for their home and whether they were in need or not if there was fresh cucumbers and they wanted them they can take them you know potatoes or onions whatever it was they can take them and it made me think about the story of Ruth and Boaz when when uh, Ruth caught Boaz's eye she was no longer in the peripheral she became focused he said, give, you know, told the people, leave a little extra for her, you know, and he would leave a little extra for her um, because she caught his eye. And so um, it's it's not anything that um, doesn't continue today. He did that for her. And I would say the same, like leaving a tip for someone if I go to um, not just even a restaurant, but a place like maybe Starbucks and I get a drink and my thing is five dollars or whatever uh say it's 459 i'll leave the change or whatever I, you know you just leave a little bit for the workers or whatever or you give them a decent 20 percent tip if you like but i'm just saying you leave a little bit for the workers even at 7-eleven i'll leave my um, pennies and dimes for whoever needs them um needs that extra change because you just don't know especially if you're going in for work you're trying to work and you're going in to get that coffee or that treat or whatever, and you're trying to rush out. And, oh, I don't have enough change. I didn't do my wallet. There's those little, you know, little change right there. You grab some and that'll help you pay for your order and go about your day. All right. Gleaning. And it's called, they were called gleaners. Okay. 19B. So that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Woo! We want these hands to be blessed. Yes. The phrase, the phrase that the Lord your God may bless you occurs three times in the book of Deuteronomy. So to me, for it to recur three times in the book of Deuteronomy is God's reminder in telling you, hey, I'm trying to bless you. Hey, this is how you get blessed. Hey, do you want these blessings? I'm telling you how to do it. And so he's telling the Israelites right there. And we don't serve God just to get his blessings. We serve God because he's our God and he's worthy of praise. He's worthy of service. But for him to bless us on top of that, that's amazing to me. That is amazing to me. So he, he says in all three cases, God's blessing is contingent on meeting the needs of others. So when we meet the needs of others, God blesses us. Um, I just heard someone say that just yesterday in a meeting, a pastor's meeting, um, she talked about all the food because it was a lunch with us and other pastors and there was and her husband's a great chef and also a man of God and he uh, served food but there was like some food items left and drink items left and she was like oh no take it take it and we're like no you can you know save it you know because they were covered and closed you can save it for your next event or whatever and she's like no the blessings come back around and they do. When you bless other people, God blesses you. So don't deter me from my blessing. When I want to bless you, let me bless you. <laughs> don't deter me from my blessing. And the same thing, when someone wants to be a blessing to you, let them be a blessing to you. Don't deter them from their blessing. And sometimes, you know, I don't want to get into motives, but we want to pray that they are acting in all honesty and they're being sincere with their gift. Amen. Uh, 19b, um, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. And he says that, and I wanted to read Proverbs 19 and 17. Um, that's a referral scripture. And Proverbs 19 and 17 says, he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward him 
for what he has done. So God says, if you're kind to the poor, you also are kind to him or you lend to the Lord and he will reward you for what you have done. I see a double blessing in that, just like before, the two things, not only will the person that you bless thank God for you, but God will also bless you for what you've done for his people. All right. Um, verse 20 to 21. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the grapevines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Again, he's saying the same three groups. And that's um, a lot of what we see. But they don't, they may not be fatherless, they may not be a foreigner, they may not be a widow, they may just be in need. Um, I think of many um, uh, single mothers that are raising children, and they might just be in need. Um, or single parent, or single fathers who are raising their children, they might just be in need. So, or a child trying to help out their family. There are a lot of, quote, immigrant children or children of, uh, of immigrants or children. Um, who are second generation, I'll say that, or second or third generation, who are out there hustling to help their families because they've seen the struggle that their family is going through and they want to help. So there are even children that are out there and they may not even be fatherless, of course, not widows or, um, or widows, and they're not considered a foreigner because they've been born and raised in this country, but they are trying to help their family and they're getting their little side hustle on and they're doing that. So if it's legal, help them out. Okay. And I think it's interesting in this, it said that um, the grape and the olive crops are often planted together and they use a method called polyculture. And polyculture is the practice of growing several crops together side by side so that they, um, um, what is it, um, pollinate each other and so that they nourish each other's soil. Um, and this is something that is done in China. There's also a company called the Polyculture Group Corporation. So it's widely practiced in other countries. Um, and I thought that it was interesting that both grapes and olives are food and fruits that are pressed. Grapes are pressed, olives are pressed. And it just, I don't know, God was just showing me how these are things that are pressed. and we are pressed to do what God says. We are pressed, just like the grape is pressed to become a fine wine. We are pressed to help our brother and sister, just like olives are pressed to get the oil out. We are pressed to help our brothers and sisters. And in that pressing, God will make us a fine wine. And in that pressing, God will get the oil out of us that is needed to anoint not only our families and ourselves, but the others that are around us, that pressing of those two items. It doesn't say that in this lesson, but this is what God gave me and put in my spirit, that the pressing of the grape and the olive, um, they're grown together. They're saying, do not shake more than that. that, you know, after it's shaken and you harvest it, do not get more let the gleaners come and get it. Let the fatherless come and get it. The widow come and get it. Let the, the foreigner, the immigrant, the person who's not, um, who's, who's not born in your culture come and get that. And, it, and those items, both of those fruits are pressed. And God would just show me that that pressing of those fruits is what God wants to do in us. He's pressing us to be better. He's pressing us to give more. He's pressing us to reach out a little bit, you know, a little bit more to go the extra mile. And when we're pressed, God blesses us to be the fine wine. He blesses us to receive the anointing oil. The, what it um, says, my cup runneth over. You, you anoint my head with oil. God is trying to anoint us and bless us, but we have to abide by his word. We have to live by his word. And I know we won't get it right all the time. I know I don't. And I, that's where I ask for grace and mercy and I ask for forgiveness. But God is trying to show us how to bless. If we just be obedient, listen to his word. Even getting dressed today, God was like, do this, do this, do that. And I was like, well, do I want to wear this? 
it's like, what did I say? I said, do this, do this, do that. And so, and that's what I did eventually. So there's a little disobedience and a little stubbornness in there. So I'm praying for that, the God to remove that from me and that I can be obedient. Some things I am right off, right off the, the bat. And then there are times when I'm like, wait, did God tell me that? And then there are other times like, but, but I, but what about, you know, but I see, you know, and then there's, there's the distraction. So I ask God to help me to be focused on what he's focused on. And he's focused on the big picture. So he sees the peripheral, he sees the insignificant, and he wants us to be there with him. We're doing Experiencing God on Wednesday nights. This is a plug, 7 o'clock p.m. You can reach us on YouTube or Facebook. And we're, um, even if you're not into the lesson right now, you can learn some tips and get some nuggets from that lesson. And we are to follow God and what he is doing, to just join him. God already has a plan. We don't have to create a plan. God has the plan. Just follow him and join in what he is doing. In conclusion, that should be my conclusion. The physical needs of others confront us daily. We see that all around us. And of course, we can't meet every single need that confronts us and is around us, that we hear on the news, that we see on the streets, that we, you know, see in our community. But God will place something on your heart. And when he does that, meet that need. And when he shows you where he's working, join him and work with him. Our prayer um, is, Father, we pray that you will help us always to see our neighbors as you see them, especially those who are often ignored or treated with contempt. Help us to treat them justly with mercy that you have shown us. In Jesus' name, amen. Another plug for Godsville Christian Fellowship, we have a food and clothing bank that helps our community and our neighbors. And it also helps some of the members of our church if we are in need of food. It helps our community and our neighbors. So we'll post that on our website at www.gwcfministries.org. Uh, You'll see that there or on our Facebook page. Got to remember, remembering how God has treated us should always govern how we treat others. So show mercy and show grace today in the means of justice to quote the marginalized or those that are in need and particularly the foreigner, the widow, and the fatherless. Please meet us this afternoon at 12.15 p.m. We are at 3500 Forest Street for praise and worship in person. Yes, we are still meeting in person. We ask that you wear a mask. We hope that you are vaccinate, vaccinated, and we ask that you social distance in our sanctuary. Please come in and worship with us, and if you can't meet us there, meet us online on Facebook, or on YouTube. May the blessings of God reach you, meet you, and beat you. <laughs> beat you down. You're so blessed that you're just overrun with them. Um, praying that God rest, rule, and abide in your heart and in your soul. Thank you so much for listening in. Until next week, God bless you. Ciao for now. That's what I tell my students. Ciao for now.